Thank you very much. Just set myself up. I won't be long. What else can I get out? I think that'll probably do. It's amazing how much you can fit in one of these handbags. There's something else hidden at the bottom here. But oh, there it is. Right. I thought before I start looking at the future, I'd look at where we came from. <laughs> no, don't please don't look for me in that picture. Um, <laughs> Sir Robert Peel founded the Metropolitan Police Service back in 1822. There were 895 officers, and they had one thing in common. They were all men. In the 1900s, the number had extended to 16,000. Once again, they were all men. In 1916, a male colleague, or male officer rather, was asked, do you think women will ever be invited to join the Metropolitan Police? His response was, no, not even if the war lasts 50 years. Three years later, in 19... Sorry, 1919, women did join the Metropolitan Police. Their main duties included looking after the prostitutes and working with small children and young adults who came into police contact. They were distinguished with the W prefix before the police constable. So they were women police constables, WPCs, and women police sergeants, WPS. Yes, I can't blame a bucket shower for my hair, <laughs> unlike Charlotte. <laughs> but I did have a hat that I could cover it with. This is me at 17. At 17, I left home, joined the Metropolitan Police, and came to London. Fantastic. Great opportunities, and I took every one of them. There was outward bounds, worked with um, mentally ill and physically ill adults, and also at a deaf school. So the opportunities were endless. At 18, I joined the regular police. As a woman police officer, we still had the W. I was still expected to look after children, although I was no more than a child myself back then. I was taught the law, how to defend myself, how to deal with mentally ill people, about race and faith, and how to arrest people. They provided me with all sorts of things. A handbag, which was great, because I had lots of books to carry, my handcuffs, a whistle, I don't think I ever used it, and it's not that effective anyway. I was provided a key, for the police boxes. Now, Doctor Who never visited Hammersmith and Fulham, so I never found a use for it. And my trusted truncheon. What they didn't teach me about my truncheon was how to deal with the innuendo that I got when I was to draw it. <laughs> I was in a class of 20 officers. Four of us were women, statistically 20%. I was, however, selected for the colour party. The first woman ever, my drill sergeant told me. Was it because I was good at marching? No, apparently I had a nice wiggle. I don't think he'd get away with saying that today. You'll notice that I was wearing a skirt. We were never issued trousers back then. Um, it proved challenging, and I wasn't one to be left behind when going over walls chasing suspects. I worked with some great officers who were also gentlemen. However, I always let them go first. In the early 90s, football hooliganism was probably at its peak, and I worked at both Fulham and Hammersmith, uh, sorry, Fulham and Chelsea football clubs. Um, it, it was an interesting scenario. I was left on the turnstiles and told, search anybody that comes in for weapons and other things that they may throw at the pitch. So that's precisely what I do. I could do that. I knew how to search people, and there was no problem there. What I wasn't prepared for was the queue that formed at my turnstile and the men dropping their trousers around their ankles, <laughs> asking to be searched. That type of learning comes with age and experience. Back at 18, I had neither. Oh, I'll go back, actually. That'll come later. So I was enjoying work. I was looking forward to doing other things, and there was plenty of opportunities in the organization to, to branch out and, and look at other opportunities, joining the drug squad, perhaps. I even considered promotion. But we, do never, we never know what's around the corner. And at 21, I found a lump in my neck. Nothing serious, but it was a bit irritating, so I thought I'd better go and get it checked out. Following a biopsy, CT scans, bone marrow tests, I was told that I had Hodgkin's lymphoma. 
It was my best friend that actually told me I had cancer because the doctors had never said that. My, my biggest fear was work. How would I be away from work? Five weeks, radiotherapy, intensive treatment. And how would I cope? What, what would happen? Would I have a job at the end of it? The duty inspector actually came to visit me in hospital and reassured me that if I got through the treatment and got myself fit again, there was no reason why I couldn't return to full active duty. So that's precisely what I set about doing. I took each day as it came, and it wasn't easy. There was a good degree of sickness. I lost a lot of my hair, but I was determined and taking each day at a time. I am a very positive person, and I always look good in every, and the best in every situation. So I did get back to work. My supervisors were very understanding. I would walk for four hours, and then they'd come and pick me up and take me out in a patrol car, because obviously my strength wasn't there to walk for eight hours. It was just too much. I have been very fortunate in my career. I've worked with some really amazing officers, and also I've had the opportunity to meet some inspiring people. Three to four years ago, I met a young lady by the name of Nicola Adams. I was really taken by her. She was beautiful, both inside and out. And she was a boxer, of all things. I actually asked her, I said, why would such a beautiful young lady want to box? Her reply was quite simply, because I'm good at it. Getting the gold at the Olympics proved that to everybody. I also managed to have a conversation with the Queen Mother, which was both warm and inspiring. I'd met senior officers, female officers, and I felt, do you know what? I can do that. And I studied for promotion. I got married. Now, in 1919, if I'd got married, they'd have kicked me out. But I was able to stay. So we'll talk about what else had changed. My truncheon had changed into my ass which is a great little piece. It's easy to carry, it's easy transportable, no innuendo, and much more effective. I love doing that, even now. <laughs> they provided me with a Met vest. Um, these are my photos off the internet, so they're not actually what we carry, but the CS spray, which has been, you know, gives a bit of distance when we're controlling people, and only today I was trained in taser supervision. So things have come a long way. Ah, I also now wear trousers, and they are now issued as a, officers really do not get the skirt. In 1999, they actually got rid of the W, and everybody became police constables. I was promoted to sergeant, and the inspector looked at me one day and said, no, you won't be able to do that. Hello? There's a challenge. Won't be able to do what? You know, there's one thing that will make me do something. It's telling me I can't do it. I signed up there and then for riot police training. With my new knowledge came new confidence. And I recognized that our proactive unit at Hounslow at the time was being quite poorly managed, and the unit were really not that dynamic and weren't producing the results. I went to see the superintendent, and the following week, I took over. Now, I had a great team of seven male officers, and I was the sergeant in charge of them, and we had some really good results. On one day, um, a suspect for a robbery came out. I'd spotted him. Being the sergeant, you always lead from the front, so I was first out of the carrier, grabbed hold of the man, put him up against the wall, and then he looked down at me. He was much bigger. Was I scared? No, not at all. The confidence of knowing that my six officers would be right behind me, <laughs> I had nothing to fear, and as he looked up, I thought, yeah, they're there. As far as the health goes, I have yearly checkups, um, not because they thought the cancer would reoccur, but because they didn't know what the long-term effects are of radiotherapy. I knew there was a high chance that I would get skin cancer, so I've never used a sunbed, and I protect myself when out in the sun. I'm quite fortunate that I don't burn. There's also, because of the area that they treated, a high chance that I'll get lung cancer. I don't smoke, and I avoid smoky places, and the smoking ban really helped. There is also a high risk that I would get breast cancer but I'd put myself onto a yearly screening program so that we could, I could be monitored. I kept myself fit and healthy and felt that, you know, everything would be fine. In November 2003, I was sat in the waiting room of my consultant, and I looked around. I was the only person in the waiting room that didn't have company with them. They didn't have a friend or a relative. I was there alone. God, I was fortunate. I didn't need that support anymore. It was just a yearly checkup. Everyone in the waiting room has one thing in common, and yet none of us speak. And that, to me, is quite strange. I sat in front of the consultant, and he said, there is a one in three chance that you could get breast cancer. Not because of any gene that I'm carrying, but because I'd had the radiotherapy treatment. 
And there was a time frame. It was seen that people who'd had radiotherapy could get breast cancer between, one, uh, between 10 and 15 years. So that there was a tight time frame. I was already 12 years, 12 years past it. He mentioned a preventative measure, and I'm thinking, yeah, great, this is good. And then he mentioned double mastectomy. Yeah, the rest of the conversation was pretty much a blur. I don't think I was listening. I just was, my mind was racing. He did mention that they could reconstruct my breasts. Now, I went home and discussed it with my family. Looking back, I've only ever regretted things I've not done. I've never regretted anything I have done. So I figured, do you know, if I have this done, I'm not going to regret it. I will never know if it prevents me getting breast cancer, but if I don't have it done and I get breast cancer, boy, there's a regret there. I wanted to see my grandchildren. I've got my kids. I wanted to see grandchildren. So it was a no-brainer, so I signed up. In April 2004, I went in for a nine-hour operation. Was I scared? Yeah, petrified. I remember crying as I kissed my children goodbye because I didn't know whether I'd come back to them. But I did. During the nine-hour operation, they removed my back muscle and put it around the front to reconstruct the best bre breast shape, and they gave me a small implant. The recovery was quite slow, more from the back than the actual front, and the scarring is, is quite neat and tidy. But I was determined that this was not going to prevent me doing anything, and that way I would have no regrets. I took each day at a time, and I built up my strength. I had a commitment that I wanted to fulfill at the Notting Hill Carnival. Sorry, job still comes first. <laughs> I was promoted to inspector. <laughs> um, and just shortly after that time, I was asked if I would go to Abu Dhabi. And there I am. Now, this was a steep learning curve for me. When I got there, you put your hand out to, be sh to shake hands, and you're completely blanked. My male colleagues were fine, they shook hands, but no, they didn't shake hands with me. Now, this was not an insult, but actually it was out of respect to mothers and wives because they don't touch any other women. Now, I gave a presentation during my stay there to a group of trainee constables. I was there to promote neighborhood policing in Abu Dhabi. I'd already been told that women do 20% the work of men, so why would they even consider having them in the organization? But they did. They had a few who had joined. And I'd noticed they'd been sat at the back of the lecture. Following on, after the lecture had finished, they asked if they could speak to me alone. OK, I could do that. Now, one of the first questions they asked me is, how do I control the men that I manage? Um, <laughs> I kind of thought, you're sitting at the back of the class, nobody really knows you're there, and, and I've already been told that you're not being very productive. You know, let's focus on what you can do. What is it you can do that is better than your male colleagues? So they have a prostitution problem in Abu Dhabi, and obviously I already knew about some of the issues they have. This was something they could deal with better than their male colleagues. Also, young women that come into police contact. So that's what I said to them. I said they had to focus on what they could do. It sounded like we're going back to the 1919, but... You know, these were things that they could do better than their male colleagues. I talked to them about being assertive and to have confidence in their own ability. When they returned to class, the instructor told me for the first time ever they sat at the front. That is a small but very significant step. Whilst I was there, that's me with some of the women, I noticed that their uniforms were very different to their male colleagues. They're very military style. I dressed the same as my male colleagues, except the long sleeves, out of respect to their face. I had an audience with a sheikh. Now, that is like their lead of police and prime minister all rolled into one. And I was asked to mention this to him, and I did, with confidence. Um, and he took it on board, and he said, yes, you're right. And they have actually now changed their uniform, and their women constables dress the same as men. Every person has different skills and abilities, and we should recognize those and value them, because it's really, really important. The opportunities for me have been great. I was last year involved in, oh, sorry, that's my long service medal. When I joined, I joined for seven years. Seven years was average for women, and I thought, if I can get past seven years, then I'm above average. So that's what I had in mind. 23 years later, I'm still here, and that was the last commissioner giving me my, uh, my long service medal. So last year, I was involved in the Olympics. That is actually the Torch Route security team. The female officer with me is a superintendent who's both become a mentor to me and a friend over the last six years and been a real inspiration. Crime is changing. 
We have far more virtual crime now. Far more crime is on computers or crime that we don't really see, the frauds and things. So we've had to change too. We now have mobile fingerprinting. There's no more black ink that you see on television programs, but we can scan somebody in the street and have their identity back in minutes. We have handheld electronic devices. No more need for all my books. Will we ever have a virtual police officer? I hope not. I think it's really important that we stay out there. But we're also communicating differently. We're tweeting. I did some tweeting during the Olympics. And we're on Facebook. Another opportunity I had was to be involved in the celebration parade. And quite purely coincidentally, I was with two other female officers um, who are exceptional officers in their own right. Um, and that was taken by somebody in the crowd. I mean, it was, you know, as somebody's already said, the atmosphere was amazing. Some of the other things we use, and the heat-seeking equipment, we use the thermal imaging to look for premises where there's been a high level um, or high heat, and, and it, it's, an, it's a sign for us that there's a cannabis cultivation going on because they need lots of heat for that. We do not really know what the future holds, but I would say embrace each new challenge and learn from them. Take every opportunity and never, ever have any regrets. We currently have a chief constable in Surrey who's a female. We've not yet had a female commissioner. It will not be me, I can guarantee you that. But it could be anybody, and it could be one of the young ladies here. Thank you very much. Thank you.